Our ancestors were much more afraid of ridicule than they were even of sinning, and far more than we are of extreme derision or mockery today. This fear and sensitiveness they showed in many ways. They were vastly touchy and resentful about being called opprobrious or bantering names, often running petulantly to the court about it and seeking redress by prosecution of the offender. And they were forever bringing suits in petty slander and libel cases. Equally with personal libel did all good citizens and all good Christians fiercely resent a word, not only of derision or satire, but even of dispassionate disapproval of either government or church. The plain speaking criticism stoically endured in politics today would have provoked a civil war three centuries ago, while freedom of judgment or expression in religious matters was ever sharply silenced and punished in New England. That ultra-sensitiveness which made a lampoon, a jeer, a scoff, a taunt, an unbearable and inflaming offense, was of equal force when used against the men of the day in punishment for real crimes and offenses. In nearly all of the penalties and punishments of past centuries, derision, scoffing, contemptuous publicity and personal obloquy were applied to the offender or criminal by means of demeaning, degrading and helpless exposure in grotesque, insulting and painful engines of punishment, such as the stocks, bilbos, pillory, and ducking stool. Thus confined and exposed to the free jibes and constant mocking of the whole community, the peculiar power of the punishment was accented. One of the earliest of these degrading engines of confinement for public exposure, to be used in punishment in this country, was the bilbos. Though this instrument came from Old England, it was by tradition derived from Bilbao. It is alleged that bilbos were manufactured there and shipped on board the Spanish Armada in large numbers to shackle the English prisoners so confidently expected to be captured. They were a simple but effective restraint, a long heavy bolt or bar of iron having two sliding shackles, something like handcuffs, and a lock. In these shackles were thrust the legs of offenders or criminals, who were then locked in with a padlock. Sometimes a chain at one end of the bilbos attached both bilbos and prisoner to the floor or wall, but this was superfluous, as the iron bar prevented locomotion. Whether the Spanish Armada story is true or not, bilbos were certainly much used on board ship. The Massachusetts magistrates brought bilbos from England as a means of punishing refractory or sinning colonists, and they were soon in constant use. In the very oldest court records, which are still preserved, of the settlement of Boston appear the frequent sentences of offenders to be placed in the bilbos, the earliest entry is in the authorized record of the court held at Boston on the 7th of August, 1632. It reads thus, Jams Woodward shall be set in the bilbos for being drunk at the new town, which was the old name of Cambridge. Soon another colonist felt the bilbos for selling pieces and powder and shot to the Indians, ever a bitterly abhorred and fiercely punished crime. The decade of life of the Boston bilbos was soon to end. In 1639 Edward Palmer made for Boston with planks and woodwork, a pair of stocks. Planks and woodwork were plentiful everywhere in the New World, and iron and iron workers at first equally scarce, so stocks soon were seen in every town, and the bilbos were disused. In Virginia the bilbos had a short term of use in the earliest years of the settlement, the provost marshal had a fee of ten shillings for laying by the heels, and he was frequently employed, but there, also, Stocks and pillory proved easier of construction and attainment. We should not be over-severe upon the bilbos in their special use in those early colonial settlements. There had to be some means of restraint of vicious and lawless folk, of hindering public nuisances, and a prison could not be built in a day. The bilbo seemed an easy settlement of the difficulty, doing effectually with one iron bar what a prison cell does with many. It was not their use, but their glare of publicity that was offensive. They were ever placed on offenders in the marketplace, in front of the meeting house on lecture day, not to keep prisoners in lonely captivity but in public obloquy. The ducking stool seems to have been placed on the lowest and most contempt-bearing stage among English instruments of punishment. The pillory and stocks, the gibbet, and even the whipping post, have seen many a noble victim, many a martyr. But the ducking stool was an engine of punishment specially assigned to scolding women, though sometimes kindred offenders, such as slanderers, make-baits, chiderers, railers, and women of light carriage also suffered through it. Yet men as well as women scolds were punished by being set in the ducking stool, and quarrelsome married couples were ducked, tied back to back. Brewers of bad beer and bakers of bad bread were deemed of sufficiently degraded ethical standing to be ducked. 
unruly paupers also were thus subdued. French writer Leblanc, who visited England about the year 1700, gives a clear description of a ducking stool. The way of punishing scolding women is pleasant enough. They fasten an armchair to the end of two beams 12 or 15 feet long, and parallel to each other, so that these two pieces of wood with their two ends embrace the chair, which hangs between them by a sort of axle, by which means it plays freely, and always remains in the natural horizontal position in which a chair should be, that a person may sit conveniently in it, whether you raise it or let it down. They set up a post on the bank of a pond or river, and over this post they lay, almost in equilibrium, the two pieces of wood, at one end of which the chair hangs just over the water. They place the woman in this chair and so plunge her into the water as often as the sentence directs, in order to cool her a moderate heat. The tray bucket was a stationary and simple form of a ducking machine consisting of a short post set at the water's edge with a long beam resting on it like a seesaw. By a simple contrivance it could be swung round parallel to the bank, and the culprit tied in the chair affixed to one end. Then she could be swung out over the water and seesawed up and down into the water. A tumbrel, or scold's cart, was a chair set on wheels and having very long wagon shafts, with a rope attached to them about two feet from the end. When used it was wheeled into a pond backward, the long shafts were suddenly tilted up, and the scold sent down in a backward plunge into the water. When the ducking was accomplished, the tumbrel was drawn out of the water by the ropes. At the time of the colonization of America the ducking stool was at the height of its English reign, and apparently the amiability of the lower classes was equally at ebb. The colonists brought their tempers to the new land, and they brought their ducking stools. In the statute books of Virginia from that time many laws may be found designed to silence idle tongues by ducking. One reads. The court in every county shall cause to be set up near a courthouse a pillory, a pair of stocks, a whipping post and a ducking stool in such place as they think convenient, which not being set up within six months after the date of this act the said court shall be fined five thousand pounds of tobacco. In actions of slander caused by a man's wife, after judgment passed for damages, the woman shall be punished by ducking, and if the slander be such as the damages shall be adjudged as above five hundred pounds of tobacco, then the woman shall have ducking for every five hundred pounds of tobacco adjudged against the husband if he refuse to pay the tobacco. The fee of a sheriff or constable for ducking was twenty pounds of tobacco. One of the latest, and certainly the most notorious sentences to ducking was that of Anne Royal, of Washington. This extraordinary woman had lived through an eventful career in love and adventure, she had been stolen by the Indians when a child, and kept by them fifteen years, then she was married to Captain Royal, and taught to read and write. She traveled much, and wrote several amusing books. She settled down upon Washington society as editor of a newspaper called the Washington Paul Pry and of another, the Huntress, and she soon terrorized the place. No one in public office was spared, either in personal or printed abuse, if any offense or neglect was given to her. A persistent lobbyist, she was shunned like the plague by all congressmen. John Quincy Adams called her an itinerant virago. She was arraigned as a common scold before Judge William Cranch, and he sentenced her to be ducked in the Potomac River. She was, however, released with a fine. One of the earliest institutions in every New England community was a pair of stocks. The first public building was a meeting house, but often before any house of God was built, the devil got his restraining engine. It was a true English punishment, and was of most ancient date. In the Cambridge Trinity College Psalter, an illuminated manuscript illustrating the manners of the 12th century, may be seen the quaint pictures of two men sitting in stocks, while two others flout them. So essential to due order and government were the stocks that every village had them. Sometimes they were movable and often were kept in the church porch, a sober Sunday monitor. In England, petty thieves, unruly servants, wife-beaters, Sabbath breakers, revilers, gamblers, drunkards, ballad singers, fortune tellers, traveling musicians and a variety of other offenders, were all punished by the stocks. Doubtless the most notable person ever set in the stocks for drinking too freely was that great man, Cardinal Woolsey. About the year 1500 he was the incumbent at Lymington, and getting drunk at a village feast, he was seen by a local justice of the peace, who humiliated the cardinal by thrusting him in the stocks. The Boston magistrates had a pair of bilbos doubtless brought from England, 
but these were only temporary, and soon stocks were ordered. It is a fair example of the humorous side of Puritan law so frequently and unwittingly displayed that the first malefactor said in these strong new stocks was the carpenter who made them. Edward Palmer for his extortion in taking one pound, 13 shillings, 7 pence for the plank and woodwork of Boston stocks is fined 5 pounds and censured to be set an hour in the stocks. In Virginia a somewhat kindred case was that of one Henry Charlton of Hungers Parish in 1633. For slandering the minister, Charlton was ordered to make a pair of stocks and set in them several Sabbath days after divine service, and then ask Cotton's forgiveness for using offensive words concerning him. Just as soon as the Boston stocks had been well warmed by Carpenter Palmer they promptly started on a well-filled career of usefulness. They gathered in James Luxford, who had been sentenced for bigamy. He had to pay a fine of £100 and be set in the stocks one hour upon the following market day after lecture, and on the next lecture day also, where he could be plainly seen by every maid and widow in the little town, that there might be no wife number three. Then a watchman of the town, for drinking several times of strong waters, took his turn. Soon a man for uncivil carriages was stocked. Every town was enjoined to build stocks. In 1655 Medfield had stocks, and in 1639 Newbury and Concord were fined for the one of stocks, and Newbury was given time till the next court session to build them. The town obeyed the order, and soon John Perry was set in them for his abusive carriage to his wife and child. Portsmouth, New Hampshire, built stocks in a cage. Plymouth had a constant relay of Quakers to keep her stocks from ever lying idle. In the southern and central colonies the stocks were a constant force. Web 80, for two breaches of the Sabbath was ordered to be set in the stocks, then to find a master, and if not complying with this second order the town would find one for him and sell him for a term of service. This was the arbitrary and not unusual method of disposing of lazy, lawless and even lonely men, as well as of more hardened criminals, who, when sold for a term of service, usually got into fresh disgrace and punishment through disobedience, idleness and running away. Regard for church and state were often combined by making public confession of sin in church with punishment in front of the church after the service. The offender had to come into the church at morning prayer, and say publicly that he was sorry, he was then set in the stocks until the end of the evening prayer. The punishment was generally repeated on the next market day. It seems scarcely necessary to describe the shape and appearance of stocks, for pictures of them are so common. They were formed by two heavy timbers the upper one of which could be raised, and when lowered, was held in place by a lock. In these two timbers were cut two half-circle notches which met two similar notches when the upper timber was in place and thus formed round holes, holding firmly in place the legs of the imprisoned culprit. Sometimes the arms were thrust into smaller holes similarly formed. Usually, however, the culprit sat on a low bench with simply his legs confined. Thus securely restrained, he was powerless to escape the jests and jeers of every idler in the community. It is interesting to note in all the colonies the attempt to exterminate all idle folk and idle ways. Vagrants, and those who were styled transients, were fiercely abhorred and cruelly spurned. They were often whipped from town to town, only to be thrust forth in a few weeks with fresh stripes to another grudged resting place. Such entries as this of the town of Westerly, Rhode Island, might be produced in scores. September 26, 1748 that the officer shall take the said transient forthwith to some public place in this town and strip him from the waist upward, and whip him twenty stripes well laid on his naked back, and then be by said officer transported out of this town. There is, in truth, a certain fitness in setting in the stocks for drunkenness, a firm confining of the wandering uncertain legs, a fixing in one spot for quiet growing sober, and meditating on the misery of drunkenness, a fitness that with the extreme of publicity removed, or the wantonness of the spectators curbed, perhaps would not be so bad a restraining punishment after all. Some of the greatness and self-control of the later years of Cardinal Woolsey's life may have come from those hours of mortification and meditation spent in the stocks. The pillory or stretch neck can be traced back to a remote period in England and on the continent. Certainly to the 12th century. In its history, tragedy and comedy are equally blended, and martyrdom and obloquy are alike combined. Seen in a prominent position in every village and town, its familiarity of presence was its only retrieving characteristic, near churchyard and in public square was it ever found, local authorities forfeited the right to hold a market unless they had a pillory ready for use. 
It was an upright board, hinged or divisible in twain, with a hole in which the head was set fast, and usually with two openings also for the hands. Often the ears were nailed to the wood on either side of the head hole. It would be impossible to enumerate the offenses for which Englishmen were pilloried, among them were treason, sedition, arson, blasphemy, witchcraft, perjury, wife-beating, cheating, forestalling, forging, coin-clipping, tree-poling, gaming, dice-codging, quarreling, lying, libeling, slandering, threatening, conjuring, fortune-telling, drunkenness, impudence. One man was set in the pillory for delivering false dinner invitations, another for a rough practical joke, another for selling an injurious quack medicine. All sharpers, beggars, impostors, vagabonds, were liable to be pilloried. So fierce sometimes was the attack of the populace with various annoying and heavy missiles on pilloried prisoners that several deaths are known to have ensued. Lecture Day, as affording in New England, in the pious community, the largest gathering of reproving spectators, was the day chosen in preference for the performance of public punishment by the pillory. Hawthorne says of the Thursday lecture, the tokens of its observance are of a questionable cast. It is in one sense a day of public shame, the day on which transgressors who have made themselves liable to the minor severity of the Puritan law receive their reward of ignominy. The disgrace of the pillory clung, though the offence punished was not disgraceful. Thus in the year 1697 a citizen of Braintree, William Vesey, was set in the pillory for ploughing on a Thanksgiving day, which had been appointed in gratitude for the escape of King William from assassination. The stiff old Braintree rebel declared that James II was his rightful king. Five years later Vesey was elected a member of the general court, but was not permitted to serve as he had been in the pillory. Throughout the Massachusetts jurisdiction the pillory was in use. In 1671, Thomas Withers for surreptitiously endeavoring to prevent the providence of God by putting in several votes for himself as an officer at a town meeting was ordered to stand two hours in the pillory at York. Shortly after he was similarly punished for an irregular way of contribution, for putting large sums of money into the contribution box in meeting to induce others to give largely, and then again surreptitiously taking his gift back again. Severe everywhere were the punishments awarded to counterfeiters. The Continental Bills bore this line, to counterfeit this bill is death. In 1762 Jeremiah Dexter of Walpole, for passing on two counterfeit dollars, knowing them to be such, stood in the pillory for an hour, another rogue, for the same offence, had his ears cropped. Samuel Breck, speaking of methods of punishment in his boyhood in Boston, in 1771, said, a little further up State Street was to be seen the pillory with three or four fellows fastened by the head and hands, and standing for an hour in that helpless posture, exposed to gross and cruel jeers from the multitude, who pelted them constantly with rotten eggs and every repulsive kind of garbage that could be collected. The use of the pillory in New England extended into the 19th century. On the 15th of January, 1801, one Hawkins, for the crime of forgery, stood for an hour in a pillory in Salem, and had his ears cropped. The pillory was in use in Boston, certainly as late as 1803. In March of that year the brigantine Hannah was criminally sunk at sea by its owner and its master to defraud the underwriters. The two criminals were sentenced after trial to stand one hour in the pillory in State Street on two days, be confined in prison for two years and pay the costs of the prosecution. As this case was termed a transaction exceeding in infamy all that has hitherto appeared in the commerce of our country, this sentence does not seem severe.